Hi, everybody, and welcome to part five of our 10 part GI lecture series designed for those of you studying for USMLE step one or COMLEX level one. Today, we're going to talk about the small intestine. As with most lectures, we're going to start with anatomy and then we'll move on to physiology and we'll finish it off with some clinical conditions. So, starting with anatomy, the first anatomical thing we'll talk about are the regions of the small intestine. There are three main regions of the small intestine. The first is the duodenum, highlighted in light blue. This is an important area for the beginning of nutrient absorption and um, macromolecule breakdown. This is also an important region when it comes to iron absorption. The jejunum is where your macromolecules continue to be absorbed in your intestines. And sometimes on tests, they like to note that the that folate is preferentially absorbed in the jejunum. And the last of the three small intestine regions is your ileum. And again, you're gonna have more absorption in this region. And they really like you to know that vitamin B12 is absorbed in the small intestine, in the ileum, specifically the terminal ileum of the small intestine. So we'll start by talking about the duodenum. As we just mentioned, it's the most proximal port of portion of the small intestine. And they do like to test its anatomic relationship with a few other associated organs, which we'll go over in a little bit. I wanna highlight that it is very important for iron absorption. And you'll see that some pathologies like celiac disease, which can damage your duodenal epithelium, you, you might present with iron deficiency anemia as one of your uh, symptoms because of that association. The duodenum has four primary parts. You have the first part or the superior part, the second part or descending, your third part is your horizontal part, and your fourth part of the duodenum is called your ascending part. So I'll quickly go over these four sections. The first portion of the duodenum is located right here. It's the only intraperitoneal segment of the duodenum, and it's referred to as the duodenal bulb. You can see it kind of looks like a light bulb. This is the site, if you ever have a duodenal ulcer, you're gonna see the ulcers in this region. If you ever see ulcers past this region, you really should consider Zollinger-Ellison syndrome because all of that gastric acid should have been neutralized by bicarb and ulcers should not be forming past this region. And one important landmark to realize is that the liver and duodenum connect at this region via the hepatoduodenal ligament. And I do want to spend some time talking about this ligament because it contains an important structure. So on this screen here, you can see the duodenal bulb and it's attaching. Um, there's a landmark right here. There's three vessels that are attaching from our duodenal bulb here to the liver. And that's attaching via this hepatoduodenal ligament. And so this is part of the anterior border of the lesser omentum. The lesser omentum is this region I'm just pointing out some of the anterior region of it. It also goes deeper. And what's important about this hepatoduodenal ligament is that it contains our portal triad. The portal triad is made of the common bile duct, the proper hepatic artery, and the portal vein. And one important clinical consideration is that we can actually do something called a Pringle maneuver, which is where we clamp down on this ligament which would also clamp down on the portal triad, and it can give us an idea of where a bleed might be coming from. So let me just talk about this really quickly. We have the Pringle maneuver. You can see here that the hepatoduodenal ligament and the portal triad are clamped. And so we would use this if we see something bleeding, especially around the liver, but we don't know exactly what's causing the bleed, okay? And again, this is clamping blood flow to the portal triad, which are these three vessels we just talked about. I talk about hepatic blood supply in greater detail in the liver lecture, but it's pretty straightforward to understand. All of our GI tract organs drain blood into the portal system, and that goes through the portal veins, which drain into the liver, and from there it goes to the hepatic vein, and then into the IVC, which is our main vein that drains blood back to our heart. The liver also receives a second blood supply from our hepatic artery. So in total, there are two blood sources that supply blood to the liver. 
and I've highlighted them here. But keep in mind that if there is a bleed in this region, it could also be bleeding from the hepatic vein or the IVC because they're all really close anatomically. So how do you, how do you determine what is actually bleeding? You can actually clamp down on the portal triad, which recall the portal triad has the common bile duct, proper hepatic artery, and the portal vein. So if you clamp down on these two and bleeding stops, well, actually, let's start with if bleeding continues, okay, so if you've clamped down on this artery and you still notice bleeding, then you know that it's more likely that the hepatic vein or the IVC are the bleeding vessels. On the other hand, if, it, if the bleeding does stop after you've clamped the portal triad, you have a better idea that it might be the portal vein or hepatic artery that's actually causing the bleed. And then to differentiate these, especially on tests, they will tell you that if there's a pulsating bounding bleed that stops, that sounds more like an artery. So they want you to pick the hepatic artery. Whereas if they tell you there is some oozing bleed that stops with the Pringle maneuver, they're leaning more toward a portal vein bleed. The second part of the duodenum receives drainage through multiple structures, the common bile duct right here, and the main and accessory pancreatic ducts. I've only drawn the main pancreatic duct on this image. And a condition you should think about is angular pancreas that occurs in the second part. You can see here, we talk about an angular pancreas in the pancreas section, but I just wanna point out that it is constricting that second part of the duodenum and it can cause obstruction. The third part of the duodenum is the horizontal part. And anatomically, the, the important thing to realize is that this region of the duodenum actually goes in between our aorta and our SMA. You can see this right here highlighted in the red circle. And this is important because there's a condition called SMA syndrome that can actually squeeze down on this duodenum if there's not enough fat uh, cushion surrounding the duodenum. So here's a good picture kind of highlighting this. We see our duodenum and our between our SMA and our aorta in both of these pictures. And what's going to happen in SMA syndrome is that our third portion of duodenum is going to be starting to get squeezed because there's less mesenteric fat. You can see on the left how there's plenty of fat that cushions the duodenum and keeps the lumen open, whereas on the right, that fat has been lost and now the SMA is able to push against the duodenum and actually constrict the lumen. And so there's two conditions that you should think about that could cause this, and both of them involve a rapid loss of, or a loss of this fat cushion. So the first I want you to think about is somebody with significant recent weight loss. So if a lot of your fat is mobilized, you might be losing that mesenteric fat that protects your duodenum. And then anybody who's malnourished likely doesn't have fat stores in the first place, so they could also suffer from mesenteric I mean, from SMA syndrome. And the only symptom that you really need to know is that it could cause postprandial pain, which makes sense as you have, as you eat, you're gonna have more, uh, a bolus of food pushing against this. And if you're pushing against this obstructed lumen, you can easily cause distension and inflammation. The fourth part of the duodenum is the ascending portion. And this connects to the jejunum at what's known as the duodenal jejunal flexure. That's not as important, but what is important is to know that this ligament of trites that connects to the duodenal jejunal flexure is a common landmark used to differentiate between upper and lower GI bleeds. So if a bleed occurs proximal to the ligament of trites, it's considered an upper GI bleed and distal to this would be considered a lower GI bleed. Now we can move on to the other two uh, regions of the small intestine. Both the jejunum and ileum are built for mass absorption. The jejunum is known for folate absorption, as we talked about earlier, and the ileum with a specific attention to the terminal ileum is known for vitamin B12 absorption. Let's talk now about the blood supply to the duodenum. The duodenum receives blood supply from two of our three primary GI arteries. So our proximal duodenum is part of our foregut, which should give you an idea that the celiac artery is the artery that supplies it. 
whereas our distal duodenum is part of our midgut, which would be supplied by our superior mesenteric artery. So let's go through how the proximal duodenum is actually supplied. We'll start with our celiac artery right here. It's gonna, the blood will flow from the celiac trunk through the common hepatic artery, then the gastroduodenal artery, and finally the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery to supply our proximal duodenum. And I can show that in another picture here, we have our celiac trunk, common hepatic, gastroduodenal, superior pancreaticoduodenal. So that's how the proximal duodenum is, um, receives its blood supply. And how about the distal? So the distal is a lot more straightforward. You have your superior mesenteric artery right here, and it can a branch of the SMA is the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery. Now, clinically, the only thing important to realize is that the superior and inferior pancreaticoduodenal arteries do have an anastomosis, so they can connect like this. And like we saw in the stomach lecture, if you have collateral circulation, you have a decreased risk of ischemia. For example, if we have some sort of blockage in this region, we can often supply blood from the collateral circulation from the SMA in this case, and the opposite would be true as well. Blood supply to the jejunum and ileum are, is very straightforward. They all receive branches off of the SMA. There's nothing you really need to know as far as any anastomoses, watershed areas, or collateral circulation. All you really need to know is that the SMA in general branches off at less of an angle than the celiac artery, which makes it more prone to something called acute mesenteric ischemia, which we talk about later. I'll show the diagram that I use in uh, acute mesenteric ischemia to show you what I mean. Oftentimes, superior mesenteric, I mean, acute mesenteric ischemia, excuse me, is caused by an embolic occlusion. So you have a clot that originates somewhere else and it travels down and then it gets stuck in the SMA. And so if we have a, heart, a clot in our heart, for example, that can branch off and start moving through our systemic circulation. And the first major GI organ that it might lodge in would be the celiac trunk. But because the celiac trunk is at more of an exaggerated angle to the aorta, oftentimes the clot will actually pass the celiac trunk and it'll only get lodged in the next uh, GI artery, which is our SMA, which is uh, less acute of an angle. So it can get stuck in that region. Let's talk now about the cell types of the small intestine. First, we can talk about G cells, which we also discussed in the stomach lecture. They produce gastrin. S cells produce secretin. I cells produce cholecystokinin. K cells produce a hormone called GIP. And then motilin produces a, they help facilitate something called migratory motor complexes or MMCs. So we're gonna go over each of these five now, starting with G cells. Hopefully this will be a little bit of a review. Um, and these are located in our pyloric antrum and duodenum. They're located in the lower glandular layer uh, of in our stomach. So this is from our stomach lecture. The lower glandular layer is located here. We have chief cells, G cells, and D cells in this area. Remember the upper glandular cell is where parietal cells are located. And then our surface epithelium is where our mucus cells are located, just as a reminder. And the function of these cells are just to secrete gastrin. And a good mnemonic of our G cells, there are gas cells because they provide the gas for the stomach. They increase the amount of hydrogen ion secretion. They increase gastric motility and gastric mucosa growth. And as a reminder, how to, a good way to remember that they increase the hydrogen ion secretion other than the, the mnemonic, I just want to bring you back to, again, from the stomach lecture, this mechanism by which hydrogen ions are getting secreted out into the gastrin lumen is the gastric lumen is often facilitated by gastrin. And again, we this is how it's regulated. So because it produces so much acid, you obviously would want it to be decreased in acidic environment and increased in basic environments as a homeostatic regulator. And so when we eat food, our stomach in general becomes more basic. And so then you can release more acid in, in those situations, which has physiologic benefit. 
You can also get more increased release if you have vagal stimulation. If you start using antacids, you're gonna obviously increase the pH. And then we talk about this a lot in the stomach lecture. If you have chronic gastritis and you have a lack of parietal cells producing those hydrogen ions, you're also gonna get gastrin upregulation and G cell hyperplasia. And pathologies we have to know about is Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which is a gastrinoma. I talk about that in the stomach and pancreas to, uh, lectures as well. So let's move on to a new cell we haven't discussed yet. This is the S cells. So S cells produce something called secretin. They're all located in the duodenum. So I'll draw one here. And let's talk about what secretin does. It's really important. We have all this acid that's coming from the stomach into the duodenum. So our S cells are really good about producing bicarb to neutralize all that acid. So secretin acts on the pancreas and produces bicarb, and this will help neutralize a lot of the gastric acid. And another thing to even help out more with this, to turn the tides in favor of a more basic environment, is secretin can also decrease gastric acid directly. So secretin can come in and turn off some of the gastric acid. The last thing it can do is it can increase our sphincter of OD relaxation, which we haven't talked too much about the sphincter of OD, but the sphincter of OD, if it's open, then more materials can flow in from the pancreas and the gallbladder into the duodenum. So it can facilitate enzymatic breakdown of nutrients. Our next cell we're gonna talk about are eye cells and they produce an important hormone called cholecystokinin. So these are located in the duodenum and jejunum. And what happens with eye cells is that they get stimulated by the presence of fatty acids or amino acids. So let's imagine we have fat or a fatty acid in our duodenum. These will trigger eye cells to release this cholecystokinin. And once cholecystokinin is released, it can stimulate gallbladder contraction. That's its main function. And that'll help facilitate the excretion of bile into the duodenum, which can break down fats. It can also increase pancreatic secretions, which again is physiologically important because pan the pancreas has a lot of lipases and amylases to help break down fats and sugars. And this will also relax the sphincter of OD, which like we saw with S cells, if you have a relaxed sphincter of OD, you can get increased secretion into the duodenal lumen. The last thing it'll do is it'll actually decrease gastric emptying because if there's too much fatty acids or amino acids in the duodenum, you kind of want to slow down the process and make sure you absorb everything that's already in the duodenum before you add too much to overwhelm the system. The next cell we'll talk about are K cells and they produce something called GIP. And again, these are located in the duodenum and jejunum and these are triggered by glucose specifically. I like to think of the K as candy cells. So once glucose, once K cells encounter glucose, they'll release GIP. And what GIP does, it, it, first off, it has two names, glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide or gastric inhibitory peptide. And it has two names, which reminds me it has two functions. So the first function we can talk about is that it decreases gastric um, ion secretion, which kind of goes with that second name, gastric inhibitory peptide. So you, it'll decrease hydrogen ion secretion. And the second thing it does, which is the more important of the two and the more testable of the two, is that GIP can stimulate insulin production. So GIP can act on the pancreas and increase insulin. And they like to they like you to know this mechanism because you'll actually have higher levels of insulin in your body if you consume glucose orally. Because if you just get an IV injection of glucose, you're not going to stimulate your your K cells in your duodenum or jejunum and release more insulin. So this is sometimes tested about why an oral load of glucose would cause a um, greater increase in insulin than an IV load. The last cell I just want to mention are motilin. Are motil motilin is actually a hormone, but I do want to talk about it here. So motilin is a hormone that's produced and it regulates something called migratory motor complexes. Well, which I'll refer to as MMCs. And this helps us to provide peristalsis during the fasting state. 
So if you've ever heard your stomach grumbling when you're really hungry, that's an MMC in action. And these are actually turned off, not necessarily turned off, but there's a system that overrides it. When you eat food, you have a different system that facilitates peristalsis, but MMCs are important for continuing peristalsis even when we're not eating. And a drug that we sometimes use, erythromycin, which is also a macrolide, that is a motilin receptor agonist. So if motilin helps peristaltic, peristaltic contractions, it shouldn't come as no surprise that this medication can trigger intestinal peristalsis to treat some conditions like gastroparesis. The last anatomical subsection I wanna discuss is small intestine histology. Here's a review that you might be sick of by now if you've watched some of the other lectures, but we have a lumen, a mucosa, a submucosa. We have our muscular layer, and finally the serosa or adventitia. And beyond that, you have your, your visceral peritoneum, your muscle, fat, skin, all that stuff. And just remember that the mucosa can be subdivided into the surface epithelium, the lamina propria, and then our muscular muscularis mucosa. Remember that our submucosa is important for Meissner's plexus in Meissner's with the S's. Remember submucosal Meissner's secretions. Our muscular layer has two different layers. We have our circular layer and a longitudinal muscle layer. And in between those is our myenteric plexus, which helps with peristalsis and sphincter tone. And then just remember that the serosa and adventitia are named based on whether they're intra or retroperitoneal. So now let's talk about what's going on with the small intestine. Here we have our lumen. You can see our mucosa is taking up the bulk of this picture. We have a little bit of submucosa toward the bottom and we're not gonna be able to see the other two layers in this image. So let's talk about each of the three mucosal layers that we can see. You can see our surface epithelium. I've highlighted a few of those regions right here. You can also see the lamina propria, which is kind of that connective tissue layer. And our muscular layer, the muscularis mucosa is located at the bottom. So let's talk about what goes on at each of these layers in the small intestine and what you need to know on a histology slide. So the surface epithelium is made of our simple columnar epithelium with goblet cells. These are the same type of goblet cells and surface epithelium that we talked about in the lower esophagus and stomach lecture. Goblet cells are mucus producing cells and I circled a few to the left there. And they help the whole surface epithelium provides a lining to the villi if you see these finger-like projections that are sticking out, I think we can see like five or six fingers. Those are all referred to as villi and they help enhance absorption. You can also see microvilli on the surface of these columnar cells. You can't really see it that well in this picture, but all this fuzzy area right here, this is all microvilli that are jutting out. And this whole finger-like thing is referred to as the vill villus. So crypts of Lebricon are also part of our surface epithelium, and they are invaginations of the epithelium between each villi. So you can see one crypt of Lebricon highlighted in red there. They have many important cells that are housed there. They have stem cells, which can differentiate into a number of our different small intestine cell types. So they have goblet cells, which we just talked about, our mucus producing cells. They can produce something called panet cells, and panic cells are important for microbial defenses. Because you can imagine when you're eating food, oh, there's still a lot of microbes that can make it to your small intestine. And so my mnemonic for remembering that panic cells are important in defense, I remember that panics baneth invaders. Here's a picture of a, uh, you can see panic cells here. They secrete many antimicrobial compounds and the granules stain eosinophilic. So you can see these eosinophilic granules, these pink granules located right here. And again, the mnemonic, panneth cells, baneth invaders. Another stem cell product that's within the crypts of Lebricon are our enteroendocrine cells. And what kind of cells are those? Well, endocrine means hormones, so it should come as no surprise that some of the cells we just talked about are G cells that produce gastrin, our eye cells that produce cholecystokinin, 
and our K cells, our candy cells that produce GIP, those all can be housed in these crypts of Librican. There's another cell that I just wanna mention. I've seen it on some resources. I've never seen this tested, but tuft cells also live here and they have some nonspecific immune regulatory functions. So we've talked about the surface epithelium. Let's talk about that connective tissue layer that holds up each of these villi. So um, our lamina propria provides a core for each villus and I'll draw what the lamina propria encompasses all of this region, all of this region, other than this muscularis mucosa is our lamina propria. And what's important is that the lamina propria provides this core of an artery or an arteriole, a venule and a lymphatic channel. So this all runs through the lamina propria to provide blood flow to our surface epithelium. There are three specialized structures you should know that exist throughout the small intestine in specific parts. We'll start with the Brunner's glands. So the Brunner's glands are located in the submucosa of the duodenum. I know I didn't show a really good picture of the submucosa last time, but here you can see we have our lumen, we have our, you can see some villi here. This is all of our, um, this is all of our mucosa. And here you can see our muscularis mucosa, which is the most, the deepest layer of our mucosal layer. And below that we have our submucosa. And so here's a, here are some Brunner's glands located in the submucosa of the duodenum. And their function is to secrete alkaline media to again, counteract acidic time from the stomach. And so you, when I rem think of Brunner's glands, I think of the B in Brunner's for the B in base to remember that Brunner's glands produce a basic media. Plica circularis are important for a different reason. They're located in the distal duodenum and jejunum, and the plica circularis can actually be visible through the naked eye. These folds of the membrane that you're gonna see in a second can actually be seen not just under the microscope, but in, uh, uh, from the naked eye, excuse me. The function of these is to increase absorptive surface area, which is especially important in a region like the small intestine. So if we have our lumen here, we have a villi, and remember our villi, surrounding our villi are microvilli to again, enhance absorption. So here's, if you would imagine, this is an example of a section of the small intestine that sure, you get a lot of absorption, but as you can see here, the mucosa itself is not folded in, it's just linear. So you're limited a little bit about how much absorption you can actually receive. Now, if we break that down and we show you that same image of a section of the small intestine without plica circularis, now imagine if we can fold the mucosa directly, then we can have a lot more villi and microvilli in this limited section and a lot more absorptive capacity. The last specialized structure I wanna talk about are, are Peyer's patches. These are located in the terminal ilium they're located throughout, but mostly in the terminal ilium. And their function is they house lymphoid follicles, which are our lymph nodes in our digestive tract. So that's enough anatomy for this section. We can talk about physiology and specifically with the small intestine, it's all about absorption. So we're gonna go over how different macromolecules get absorbed in our GI tract. So let's start with carbohydrates. So this is a simple carbohydrate, a simple monomer. It has six carbons. Here's our first carbon, C2, three, four, five, and C6 is the one attached up there. And what I want to point out is that there's two different ways that this molecule can bind to another monomer, okay? It, there could be a one, four linkage or a one, six linkage. So one, four linkages, our body can hydrolyze these. So this would be a 1,4 linkage. If we had another monomer here, they can combine right here and now we have a 1,4 linkage and another one and they're connected. The good news is our body can, can hydrolyze these. So if we find starch that exists in this form, we can absorb these, I mean, break them down and absorb them as monomers. 1,6 linkages are more difficult for our bodies to hydrolyze. So this would be an example of a 1,6 linkage. 
And you can imagine starch would exist as a combination of 1, 4, and 1, 6 linkages. So how carbohydrate absorption works is that first we consume starch. In our mouth, we can break it down in two ways. First off, chewing can mechanically break down the starch to some extent. And we also have alpha amylase in our saliv that is produced by a salivary, salivary glands that can hydrolyze some 1,4 bonds. So on the right side, I'll show you what that looks like. We consume starch, salivary amylase comes in, and it can break down some of these 1,4 bonds. Notice it can't break down the 1,6 bonds on the right, but this will ultimately yield some oligosaccharides and some polysaccharides. So it has some digestion, but not quite enough. Then this bolus of food will move to the stomach. Those amylases that existed in our oral cavity get broken down, and then the food continues to move on to the intestine. And in the intestine, we have pancreatic amylases that are released, and these can help finish the job to some extent, so they can also break down 1,4 bonds. And you end up with a mix of monosaccharides and disaccharides, some oligosaccharides, and you also end up with some of these things. I didn't point it out here, but you do end up with some compounds that we can't digest on our own. But the things that are important from an absorption standpoint are these mono and disaccharides, because these disaccharides can be broken down by some brush border enzymes. And then finally, the, once they're broken down into two monosaccharides, we can absorb those. So let's talk about some of the disaccharidases or the enzymes that can break disaccharides into monosaccharides. If these are enterocytes on our small intestine, we have some sugars that are coming in and the disaccharides can't freely go in, but we have enzymes called disaccharidases that can break these disaccharides into monosaccharides. So first off, we have sucrase, which can break sucrose into glucose and fructose. We have lactase, which breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. And another important enzyme is maltase, which can break down a maltose disaccharide into two glucose monosaccharides. And you've probably heard about lactose deficiency, and that's because this lactase enzyme is damaged, and we talk about that later on. Let's go over exactly how monosaccharides are able to be absorbed into enterocytes. So if this is our lumen on the top, we have an enterocyte and we have our bloodstream on the bottom. What's gonna happen is that different monosaccharides can get absorbed in different areas. And I just wanna point out, I wrote apical membrane here. So glucose and galactose use the SGL1, just SGLT1 channel to move across our apical membrane. This membrane right here that connects the lumen and the cell is our apical membrane. And then down here is our basolateral membrane, just for future reference. You can remember that the first thing they cross starts with an A, and the second thing they're gonna cross starts with a B, the basolateral. And so if we have some glucose and galactose here, they can use this SGLT1 channel to enter the cell. And what does SGLT1 stand for? That is our sodium glucose linked transporter. It's easy to remember that it's a sodium, you can see that for every, monosaccharide that enters the cell, every glucose, we have a sodium. So there's a sodium and a glucose linked. And what's important about this is when they test you on oral rehydration therapy, imagine somebody just got sick and you need to give them some hydration. Something you want to consider when you're doing that is you want to not just front load them with sugary beverages. You need to give them an equal amount of sodium and glucose when hyd rehydrating. The reason being, if you give them too much glucose, then this you're going to have too much glucose left over in the lumen because you need a good balance of sodium and glucose to enter the cell, and you're going to end up getting an osmotic diarrhea. Another thing I want to point out is that if we continued this process forever, what would happen is that our cells would just be full of sodium and there would be no concentration gradient to make this absorption happen in the first place. So we need to have some sort of active transport to facilitate this process. And that's done by way of our sodium potassium pump, which pumps two potassiums in for every three sodiums out. 
And by doing this, we can clear up all these sodiums and get them out of the cell. And now you've maintained a concentration gradient to allow this diffusion, I mean, this co-transport of the glucose and the sodium into the cell for absorption. So glucose and galactose follow this pathway. Fructose follows a little bit of a different pathway. Remember, fructose is kind of our pentagon home base shaped monomer that has five sides. So I always remember fructose is five. And that's a good way to remember that you have a GLUT5 transporter that brings fructose in. Now, once they're in the cell, they it doesn't matter if it's fructose, glucose, or galactose, they all, they all enter the bloodstream through the same transporter, which is our GLUT2 transporter. And I remember the two as they all go in together. Or you can remember it as the second channel that each of these monosaccharides have had to encounter. Something I want to talk about now is the d xylose absorption test. So how this test works is it's useful in determining why monosaccharides may not be absorbed in a certain situation. And I'll kind of go over what I mean. So how this test works is that xylose is a monosaccharide and the only thing you need to digest a monosaccharide is functional intestinal mucosa. Re recall from the disaccharidases lectures, you need I mean, when I talked about carbohydrate absorption, in order to break down the starch into the monosaccharide required several steps, several amylases, and we needed the disaccharidases to make it into a monosaccharide. But once it is in this monosaccharide form, all you need is this channel to get in or this channel in order to absorb. So how this test works is that you consume d xylose and then you measure urinary xylose levels. Remember, I don't know if you watched the gastric lecture when I talked about the Schilling test. It's the same concept where you consume something orally and you measure it in the urine. And if you measure it in the urine, that means it was absorbed in some capacity. So if you're able to absorb D xylose, what we know, since the only requirement for absorption is functional intestinal mucosa, we know that this is working just fine. And so if there is some sort of insufficiency or malabsorptive process in this patient, we know it's not because of the intestine, so we should look at other regions. It might be a pancreatic problem. Maybe the pancreas isn't producing enough amylases to facilitate absorption of other oligosaccharides and disaccharides. On the other hand, if you can't detect any d xylose in the urine, then d xylose wasn't absorbed in the first place, which means the only thing that could be damaged is your intestinal mucosa itself. And so you might see this in conditions like celiac disease, where you have blunted intestinal mucosa. Now we can move on to proteins, which is a little bit more straightforward. Proteins, if you, you'll consume proteins, and again, there's some mechanical breakdown by chewing foods. And in the stomach, we have our chief cells, which recall from our gastric lecture are our CHOMP cells because they produce pepsinogen and gastric lipase. So pepsinogen is released by these chief cells and they can break down proteins. Once this occurs, the food will then get transported into the small intestine and the pancreas secretes a number of proteases into the duodenum. And then these proteins these proteases, excuse me, are initially secreted as zymogens and they become activated in the duodenum. And finally, as these are broken down into one to three unit um, amino acid subunits, they can be absorbed in our enterocytes. I've highlighted two concepts here. They're both related to zymogens. Zymogens are enzymes that require activation in order to properly function. So we just saw that pepsinogen is secreted by our chief cells. So here's our lower glandular layer. We have some chief cells. They secrete it into what's called a gastric pit. This can get released by the chief cells into the lumen, and it's released as pepsinogen, which can't do anything. But in the presence of acid, that pepsinogen becomes activated into pepsin, and this can start breaking down proteins. Trypsinogen is produced by pancreatic acinar cells, 
And these cells, again, trypsinogen is not active right away, but they can be activated into trypsin by a few things. They can be activated by enteropeptidase. They can be activated by enterokinase as well. They could also be activated by trypsin itself. And then again, so once activated, trypsin can pretty much activate anything in the world. It can activate, like I said, trypsinogen. It can activate chymotrypsinogen, procarboxypeptidase. And the thing you have to think about is if you have a deficiency of enterokinase or enteropeptidase in, our, in your duodenum, that could actually lead to protein malabsorption because your pancreatic proteins like trypsinogen can't get activated, even if they're secreted into the duodenum itself. A more relevant clinical condition, consideration that is definitely going to be tested is pancreatitis, which is the opposite problem where you actually have premature overactivation of trypsinogen into trypsin, and this can cause autodigestion of your pancreas. So let's talk about lipid absorption now. So I'm gonna make this very simple to understand. Fatty acids are your building blocks of fat, and fatty acids are amphipathic. And I'm gonna use this term quite a bit. And what that means is that they have a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. So here's a fatty acid. You can have our hydrophilic end at the bottom, and then you have a hydrophobic end throughout most of the fatty acid. Triglycerides are connect three of these connected to a glycerol backbone. And again, you can notice triglycerides are amphipathic. They have our hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. And if we break down triglycerides, oh, actually, let me talk about gastric lipase really quick. Gastric lipase was produced by our G cells, I mean, our chief cells, excuse me, our CHOMP cells in our gastric mucosa. And they have a minor role, whereas pancreatic lipases are, play the primary role in fat digestion. So again, this is what I wanted to show you, is that triglycerides can be broken down into monoglycerides and free fatty acids. So here is a monoglyceride. Again, you notice there's a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. And free fatty acids, again, have a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. The point I'm trying to make here is that whatever you have, whether it's a triglyceride, a monoglyceride, a fatty acid, they are all amphipathic. And if you try to digest an amphipathic molecules, you might have some trouble unless you have a secret weapon, which fortunately we do have. So if this is our proteases, and they want us to digest these amphipathic molecules. The problem is they're gonna, because the lumen itself is very water, watery, the hydrophilic ends will form a ball and the lipid ends will kind of protect themselves in this lipid core. So if proteases try to come on in here to digest something, they're gonna get a rude awakening when it's surrounded by this hydrophilic end that will take more time to digest. The good news is we have something called bile. And bile, as you can see from the lettering, how it's blue and red, bile is also amphipathic. And what that means is that instead of forming this cluster that protects themselves in these fatty clusters, you can actually have bile come in and help digest the, I mean, help essentially release the fatty acids. And I'll show this in a better picture in a second. And this allows the proteases to digest the fatty acids a little bit easier because it's now it's in this, it's been, the lipid's been emulsified in some way. I think this is an easier picture to understand it. So we have our big fatty acid here. And remember the hydrophilic ends are gonna surround the outside and we're gonna have this lipid filled core of hydrophobic material. And you can notice the fatty acids drawn there and our pancreas, my proteases would love to come into this lipid core and digest all of that, but it's really tough because it's surrounded by this hydrophilic end. It would take a lot longer. They could still do it. It would just take a lot longer to digest it in this capacity. You're not having as much of the surface area of the fat dissolved at one time. But if you have bile coming in and binding to this region, it can actually break it down into several of these different smaller fatty acid molecules. And with these, now you can have proteases that surround each of these smaller molecules and you enhance lipid absorption or digestion. So once the 
fatty acids are broken down enough, they turn into something called micelles. And these micelles or micelles are small enough to diffuse across the enterocyte membrane. Now, once they're across the membrane, they can't diffuse across the basolateral surface and into our blood vessels or our lymphatic region without a few other modifications. So the main modification required is this ApoB48 protein needs to be attached to these micelles. So you can see an apolipoprotein attached here. And once this ApoB48 protein is attached, it can, it can be cleared for transportation into our lymphatic system. And so a mnemonic I saw in first aid is that you need ApoB48 for the B48 chylomicron lipid bombers. I don't know if you know the B48 jets that, that were used in wars, but this is a helpful mnemonic to remember the number 48. Something I wanna point out here is that these micelles, even though they can diffuse across the enterocytes, they're still too big for the capillaries. And so instead of diffusing across the capillaries, they're actually released into our lymphatic system first. And so here's our lymphatic system. And now because it has that apolipoprotein attached to it, it can be released here. And ultimately it will enter our systemic circulation by way of the thoracic duct into our subclavian vein. And I just wanted to point this out when we talked a little bit ago about our histology I told you that the lamina propria has a capillary and lymphatic system and a vein. And so what's happening here is that if fat's coming in from the lumen, it's going to be absorbed into this green lymphatic system because this the capillaries are a little too small to facilitate the, uh, the absorption of the micelles. One thing I do want to point out is the fecal fat test. It's, it's pretty much what you would expect it to be. It just measures the level of fat in your stool over somewhere between a 24 and 72 hour period. And a positive fecal fat test suggests malabs fat malabsorption. And what I want to remind you, they usually don't give you a fecal fat test in isolation. Sometimes they'll give you the fecal fat test and then they'll also give you the desilose test. So imagine a fecal fat test is positive all that tells you is that there's some sort of fat malabsorption and it could be anything. But if they give you a fecal fat test positive and they also tell you that the d xylose test shows up as positive, they find urinary, let's say they find urinary d xylose, then you know that the intestinal mucosa is working fine and that should hone you in more. It might be something like a pancreatic insufficiency. So. Keep in mind that sometimes they'll give you a question that talks about both the fecal fat test and the D-xylose absorption test to try to get you to hone in on exactly what portion of your GI tract may be injured. We touched a little bit about bile, but let's go over bile in greater detail. So bile is synthesized in the liver and after being synthesized, it gets stored in the gallbladder. And once it's released, usually in the presence of something like cholecystokinin, it's going to um, be secreted into our duodenal lumen. So how that works is that we have bile, it's stored in our gallbladder. And if we have some sort of fat that's stimulating our eye cells to secrete cholecystokinin, our gallbladder will contract. And once it contracts, it's gonna flow down and into our duodenum. How is it resorbed? It's not absorbed as you might expect. So the bile acids and salts, don't diffuse across the membrane like our the mycelles did. They're actually reabsorbed in the same region as vitamin B12 is, which is the terminal ileum. And something to consider is that if you have any condition that damages your terminal ileum, not only would you have a potential B12 deficiency, but you'll end up with a bile salt deficiency. And because we just saw how important bile is in absorbing fat, this bile salt deficiency could actually give you a fat malabsorption. So this is the same picture we just showed. We have bile, we have proteases that can degrade these down into these small micelles, which can diffuse across the membrane. If the bile tries to diffuse across, it's not gonna be able to. So the bile has to travel all the way down to our terminal ileum where it can be properly reabsorbed. If our terminal ileum is damaged, however, 
then this reabsorption isn't possible and you start losing bile. And if you start losing bile and you develop that deficiency, then you will get a uh, fat malabsorption. The second thing I want you to know is that there are actually drugs that want this process to happen. So bile acid resins like cholestyramine, cholecevalam, and cholestipol, they inhibit bile acid reabsorption. And so, and which would ultimately lead to fat malabsorption, but this would be what you'd want in a medication for somebody who has something like hyperlipidemia. And now that we've gone over both lipids and bile, I just want to mention that if you see a patient with fat malabsorption, you have to look at multiple aspects that may be contributing to the fat malabsorption. If your pancreas isn't producing enough lipases and something like pancreatic insufficiency, that could cause it. But it could also be your intestinal mucosa itself is damaged or has a problem. Your liver, if it's not synthesizing bile in the first place, that could cause fat malabsorption. And your terminal ileum, like we just mentioned, can cause fat malabsorption because there's not enough recycling of the bile into your enterohepatic circulation. Let's move on to vitamins. I want to talk about fat-soluble vitamins, then folate and B12. So fat-soluble vitamins, sometimes they're referred to as your ADEC, so vitamin A, D, E, and K. Any condition that causes fat malabsorption, you should always think about the potential for a fat-soluble vitamin deficiency as well. And the presentations are really random at times, so it's something you should always be on the lookout for. I'll give you some of the common ways these are tested. So vitamin A is found in your skin and in your visual pigments. So the two symptoms you should always look out for are skin changes. So you can see dry scaly skin and you can see something called beto spots or night blindness. Vitamin D, as you might be aware of, is important for bone mineralization and calcium absorption. So again, the two things you'll expect are weak bones. So you might get osteomalacia or osteoporosis and you might have hypocalcemia and the symptoms associated with that, like tetany. Vitamin E is lower yield, but sometimes tested. You just have to know that it protects our red blood cells. So you might end up seeing something like hemolytic anemia, acanthocytosis. You could also see demyelination of the posterior columns. I, I don't think I've seen a test question on that specifically. They usually talk more about the blood related disorders. And vitamin K is a cofactor for several of our clotting factors. So I think this is the first time we're seeing the clotting cascade. All I want you to know for now is that the this whole cascade, the goal of it is just to create a clot. That's why it's called the clotting cascade. I don't want to scare you about this. We'll go into this in more detail, especially in the liver section and a little bit in the pancreas section when I talk about DIC briefly. But all you need to know for now is that this whole cascade is designed to create a blood clot. And vitamin K helps to produce several of these molecules. So any factor two, which is thrombin here, seven, nine, or 10, that can all be produced through a reaction that requires vitamin K. So if you're deficient in vitamin K, then you can't form these stable fibrin clots. And that's why the main symptom of vitamin K deficiency is a risk of bleeding. These are synthesized in the intestine, the vitamin K is. And it's important to note that our bodies don't synthesize it. We actually have bacteria that synthesize most of our vitamin K. And so you could actually have in very, very young kids who don't receive a vitamin K injection because they don't receive proper prenatal care, you can get something called hemorrhagic disease of the newborn where they bleed a lot because they don't have any vitamin K stores. Vitamin B9 or folate, it's usually acquired through plants. That's, you think folate is foliage. And so you don't get a deficiency in vegans. Vegans, you need to consider B12 because it's an animal product, vitamin D, and iron deficiency. But they usually don't have a folate deficiency. And you usually need jejunum and ileum to be working in order to properly absorb it. Folate deficiency is somewhat rare, though. 
the condition that I think they test folate deficiency on most is tropical sprue, which we discuss later. But folate, to be honest, is not as high yield. Vitamin B12 is definitely important. I went over a lot of B12 concepts in our stomach lecture, but I'll just remind us how it works. It's always good practice to remember. So our B12 is bound to animal product and it enters our oral cavity. There we have our binder produced and each of these travel to the stomach. The acid in our stomach will cleave B12 from our animal protein and our binder will quickly bind to B12 because if it doesn't, then B12 would get degraded by the acid. So our, at this time, intrinsic factors getting produced by our parietal cells and all of this moves to the duodenum. Uh, our binder has done its job of basically protecting the B12 in the stomach. So the pancreatic proteases will help leave B12 from our binder. And remember the intrinsic factor that was produced in our stomach, that has also been flowing down our intestinal tract and can now bind to B12. And together this complex can travel down to our terminal ileum. And once in the terminal ileum, this complex can be reabsorbed. And ultimately the B12 will get stored in the liver where you can have up to a five year supply of B12. I also talked about the causes of B12 deficiency. I just wanna briefly go over some of the important ones. We have pernicious anemia, or if you have a gastrectomy, you might have def deficient intrinsic factor production. So on this slide here, if you imagine you don't have enough intrinsic factor and we take that out, then B12 can't even get through because it needs this B12 IF complex to be reabsorbed in the terminal ileum and you get a deficiency. For something like pancreatic insufficiency, that can cause B12 deficiency because the proteases are required to cleave that B12 R binder. And if you don't have proteases, then you'll have B12 stuck to R binder. And again, that won't be able to be reabsorbed. If you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, what happens there is that the intestines, I mean, the bacteria within the intestines actually like to consume B12 themselves. So if you don't have enough B12 binding with intrinsic factor because it's all being eaten by your bacteria overgrowth, then you won't get absorption. For Crohn's disease, what happens here is that the terminal ileum itself is damaged. So even if everything else is working properly, if you don't have a healthy terminal ileum to reabsorb this complex, then you, you might have B12 deficiency. And the last one I'm gonna talk about is this tapeworm infection. What's kind of cool about this one is that it can cleave this complex. So it actually breaks apart this B12 intrinsic factor complex, which presents, prevents the absorption. This I talk about in the stomach lecture about why each of these things is what it is. I just want to remind you the differences between B12 and folate deficiency and the similarities. So both of them would cause a megaloblastic macrocytic anemia, elevated homocysteine, and they could cause glossitis. But the difference is that B12 can cause neurologic symptoms because it and subacute combined degeneration, as well as elevated methylmalonic acid levels. And so that's how you differentiate it. I would recommend going to see the stomach lecture because I talk about why each of these things are the way they are. And again, from the stomach lecture, this is just something to keep in mind about how somebody with B12 deficiency presents. They could present with neurologic symptoms and on laboratory findings, you're gonna see not only an elevated homocysteine level, but you'll also see an elevated methylmalonic acid level. The last thing I wanted to mention are, is iron absorption. Usually it's, this is hemochromatosis and is tested in the liver section, which I mentioned, and most of our section is in the liver. I just wanna point out that the iron absorption is all happening in the duodenum. So how does that work? We have two different types of iron. You have heme iron and non-heme iron. Heme iron is easier to absorb. You have a he, and it usually comes from animal products. So let's say you have a piece of steak or chicken. What's going to happen is that you've consumed some of the red blood cells. And a red blood cell is made of hemoglobins, which is can be broken down into heme and globin. 
this heme that's in that red blood cell can be transported directly into the cell. And from there, iron can be, iron can be extracted. This iron can be either stored in storage form as ferritin, or it can be transported later on. And ultimately, this iron, if it's not stored in the, as ferritin, it can be transported into our bloodstream. Non-heme iron has a little bit different mechanism. This actually starts in this form, this Fe3+, which is called the ferric form, I should have mentioned. This cannot be absorbed so easily. You have to have it in the ferrous form, which is the Fe2+. I always remember that. I think of like the ideal amount of people on a Ferris wheel is probably two, you know, because you can have a nice date. And so Fe2+, the Ferris form is preferred. But let's say your buddy Eric comes along and he wants to tag along onto your romantic Ferris wheel ride. Then it becomes this ferric form and, you know, three's, three's kind of a crowd. So how do we absorb it? We actually need something called cytochrome B now to change the... Uh, ferric form of iron into the ferrous form. And this is all done with the help of a cofactor of vitamin C. If you've ever heard that iron absorption is improved in the setting of vitamin C, this is the reason why, because it helps transform the ferric iron into the ferrous form. And now that you have the ferrous iron, it can be absorbed with our DMT1 enzyme Something I want to point out is that this enzyme is not specific to ferrous form of iron. Anything that has a divalent metal, any of the divalent metals, which just means the two plus metals, like all of these, can also be absorbed. So if you took iron tablets with a glass of milk, you might actually decrease your absorption because the calcium will use the DMT1 transporter and the iron might just go down your GI tract. Again, this can either be transported transferred into ferritin, or it can use that same ferric portin enzyme to enter our bloodstream. Once it's in our bloodstream, it's often transported as this ferric form, and it's bound to this protein called transferrin. And once this, the whole point of this uh, ferric form is that it could be stored in a number of different um, body parts. So it can go into your spleen, it can go into your bones, and it could also get stored in your liver. How is this regulated? Imagine that you had a ton of this iron floating through your bloodstream. You'd have, you could have a problem. The good news is our liver can produce this enzyme called hepcidin and, or hepcidin, and hepcidin can come and bind to these ferroportin uh, enzymes and turn them off. And if you don't have active ferroportin, then what's going to happen is that no, uh, none of the iron can actually go from your enterocyte into your bloodstream, and you'll have less iron. And so in something like hemochromatosis, the whole problem of hemochromatosis, it's not necessarily a liver problem. It's that you have defective hepcidin or hepcidin. And if you have defective hepcidin, these ferroportin channels can work just fine and you could have a ton of iron flooding your bloodstream. Now we can move on to clinical conditions. There's quite a few in the small intestine and some of them have a little bit of overlap, so it's important to distinguish these. We'll start with probably the most important, which is celiac disease. So celiac disease is an autoimmune intolerance of gliadin, which is a part of gluten and it causes T-cell mediated tissue damage. There's an association of celiac disease with HLA DQ2 and DQ8. So there's a genetic predisposition. And I always remember this from the mnemonic hate to have DQ, like Dairy Queen. And you can see the eight is for the hate, the two is for the, the two, and DQ is obviously, so that, that reminds me there's DQ2 and DQ8. So let me show you what I mean by this. Imagine that we, as somebody who has this genetic predisposition, imagine that they eat something that has gliadin in it. What's gonna happen is that that can get absorbed into our, our, our cells. It can bind to a cell which can present it, like an antigen presenting cell. 
And then the T cell will come in and recognize this as some foreign dangerous material and it'll start sending out cytokines and it'll attack your own intestinal mucosa thinking that you've just encountered some dangerous pathogen when in reality you just encountered a little bit of gliadin. So what's going to happen here? This presents in a couple of different ways. They have two presentations they like. The first and most common presentation you'll see on a test, they'll give you either a teenager or some young adult who it's usually a woman with some autoimmune disorder, and they'll have a collection of GI symptoms. They'll have abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloating, weight loss, and a common one that if you ever notice a woman with iron deficiency anemia, a young woman, they really, I've noticed this on tests, is that is very strongly associated with their celiac disease on tests. Another way you might see this is that you might have a child who is not growing as well as you'd like for them to grow, and that could also be related to celiac disease. So on, on laboratory findings, you can find antibodies against endomesium, tissue transglutaminase, and gliadin. The antibody against gliadin makes a lot of sense. They do like to test the other ones though too, so you should know any antibodies against endomesium and tissue transglutaminase, which is TTG. Some of these people who have celiac actually have IgA deficiency. So sometimes you actually have to test the IgG antibodies as well. If you took a duodenal, if you took a piece of duodenum, this is important to know what it's going to show. It's going to show something called villus atrophy, intraepithelial lymphocytosis, and crypt hyperplasia. So I want to talk about what that actually looks like. So this is villus atrophy. And if we compare it to our normal duodenal mucosa that we've been talking about, you notice how the villi up here are, are very rounded. They still look like these finger-like projections, right? As we just saw, if our T cells are releasing all these cytokines and destroying our intestinal mucosa, what's going to happen is that over time, all of this area will be damaged and it's you're going to end up with this blunted uh, villi. That's what's called villus atrophy. You also might see crypt hyperplasia. You can see these crypts of Librecon are huge right now. And you'll also see the third thing they sometimes mention is intraepithelial lymphocytosis. You can see the abundance of lymphocytes in this region. And that's due to the autoimmune response. Treatment's very straightforward. If gluten is causing a problem, then you just take out gluten and you should be good. There's a few complications I wanna talk about. The first one's um, maybe not a complication. Yeah, it's still a complication. So this is a skin condition that can happen in people with celiac disease called dermatitis herpetiformis. So this is an autoimmune rash. It looks like herpes. It kind of has that dew drops on a rose appearance. So that's why it had its name, but it has nothing to do with herpes infection. And what's actually happening here is that autoantibodies are depositing into the skin and those T cells that we talked about earlier, are, and then those inflammatory cells can activate if you have autoantibodies depositing into the skin. Another complication that I wanna mention is more long-term, and but they're very dangerous. Uh, people with celiac disease can develop T cell lymphoma or small bowel carcinoma because of all that activation, you can get some mutations that cause these, the T cells to overactivate and into a lymphoma. And I really want you to consider this in somebody who has celiac disease, has stopped eating gluten, and they're still having these really bad symptoms, or they had celiac disease and it started to go away and then it came back with a vengeance and they didn't do anything different from a dietary standpoint. That's when you should start considering these more dangerous conditions like T-cell lymphoma and small bowel carcinoma. Let's talk about lactose intolerance now and compare and contrast it to celiac disease. So the mechanism of lactose intolerance, as you may know, is you have a deficient lactase enzyme that can't break down lactose into the monosaccharides. And if you can't break those enzymes down, you're gonna have all these saccharides in your lumen, which can cause an osmotic diarrhea. 
So if, if this is our lumen here, if you have normal lactase, what's gonna happen is that our disaccharides come in, our lactase can break them down into monosaccharides and they can be absorbed, no problem. In lactase deficiency, we don't have those lactase enzymes, so they continue on and you have a lot of them coming in. And whenever you have a lot of substrate, what's gonna happen is that water likes to follow the solute. So water's gonna enter this GI tract and you'll end up with an osmotic diarrhea. How this will present, it's usually flatulence, bloating, and diarrhea after consuming dairy products. You also might see it in a few other places. Um, you don't get any weight loss with this. And this is what I meant. The other place you might see it is if you have somebody presenting with the same symptoms after a recent GI illness. So what happens in a GI illness is that we have our lactase enzymes working here and they're right at the brush border. So they're right at the interface between the lumen and the enterocyte. And obviously that you need them there so that they can actually break down these disaccharides. What happens though is after a GI illness, let's say you have a bacteria or let's say you have a virus in your tract, what's gonna happen is your white blood cells will see that and they'll just throw everything under the sun at these, right? And so yeah, it'll kill the bacteria or virus, but it could damage the top of your brush border too. So if you don't have any of more of your lactase enzymes temporarily, then you could actually have a bunch of disaccharides leaving and you have the same symptoms, the osmotic diarrhea. This should just be temporary, but this is why it's really not recommended to drink too much dairy products after some GI illness, just because you might it might just end up being uh, excreted if you don't have enough lactase enzymes replenished. So an important thing to consider and a good differentiating factor to celiac disease is that if you look under histology, people with lactose intolerance will have normal small intestinal mucosa. There's a couple other ways you can test out for lactose intolerance. You can do something called a lactose hydrogen breath test, and you could also check their stool pH. So let's talk about both of these now. If you have lactose deficiency, you're gonna have a lot of disaccharides. And what happens is as these disaccharides move along, as, your, as the lactose moves along, uh, you have bacteria in your gut that can break this down into hydrogen gas and fatty acid because they can use the sugars because they don't have this deficiency. And so you can, physiologically, you can use this. So our lactose hydrogen breath test actually measures the amount of hydrogen gas that you can exhale after consuming lactose. So if you have a deficiency, what's going to happen is that you have increased hydrogen gas and we can measure that. And then another thing we can do is we can measure the pH and that will be more acidic than normal because these fatty acids that have been broken down by these bacteria can get de uh, excreted into the stool, causing a lower stool pH. So treatment of lactose is pretty straightforward as well. You just avoid dairy products. Tropical sprue is sometimes tested. It's caused by damage to villi. We don't know too much about tropical sprue. It affects the jejunum first, followed by the ileum. And the presentation, and they will have to be very straightforward on this if they're going to test this. They have to tell you that they visited the tropics recently and they've had some sort of infectious diarrhea recently. If they don't mention this, I don't want you to assume that it's tropical sprue. And you can get a folate deficiency and a B12 deficiency, which makes sense that it affects the jejunum and ileum. And to treat this, you have to treat it with long courses of antibiotics. Again, there's not much known about tropical sprue. So if they test it, they really have to give you that recent visitor to the tropics. Whipple disease is also related to an infection. And this is caused by Trophorima whippleii. You'll see this in older men, and this has a classic presentation of cardiac symptoms, joint pains, and neurologic symptoms. It can also cause fat malabsorption and diarrhea, which I'll talk about the mechanism right now. We've already seen that our lipids break down into micelles. They can diffuse across the membrane. You get a protein added on, and ultimately, 
that whole mycelial with the apolipoprotein can go into our lymphatic system. What happens with, and here's an example of that, we have an enterocyte, it would come into this green lacteal, and ultimately it'll reach our bloodstream by way of the thoracic duct. What I want you to realize in Whipple's disease, it has this interesting mechanism where a lot of macrophages come in and actually compress our lymphatics. So imagine you have a ton of this Trophorima whipplei growing. We're gonna have white blood cells coming in and saying, and trying to stop it. And in the process, all these white blood cells will actually compress our lacteals and the fat can no longer escape into the uh, lacteal and you'll get, you can get fat malabsorption by way of this mechanism. On histology, you're gonna see this classic PAS, periodic acid shift positive foamy macrophages in the lamina propria. So what does that mean? This is from our liver section that's gonna come up later. And I talked about periodic acid shift staining then. What I want you to know for the purpose of this is that it really just detects polysaccharides, proteins, and lipids inside tissues, right? So in the case of alpha-1 antitrypsin, you're gonna see that we have a lot of glycoproteins that cause it to be PAS positive. For Whipple's disease, we're gonna have a lot of glycolipids, which should make sense because we're having this poor absorption of our lipids due to this lacteal compression. So if we look inside, we can see a villi, right? We can see a few villi right here. And so this is our lamina propria. You notice how it stains pink. That's the PAS positive stain. All throughout here, you can see these foamy macrophages. It kind of has this foamy material, this almost like tissue paper material. Those are all foamy macrophages. And if you stain those, they'll turn pink because the, PA, the periodic acid shift stain stains pink when it's positive. My mnemonic for Whipple's disease or Whipple disease, I remember it as a can of Whippass. And so for can, I think of cardiac, arthralgias, and neurologic symptoms. And I also think if you're sitting on the can too much, you might have diarrhea. That's where, that's how I think of can. Whip makes sense because of Whipple disease. And PAS is for our PAS positive foamy macrophages. A beta lipoproteinemia is a deficiency of these lipoproteins, B48 and B100. And fat malabsorption occurs because of that defective A B48 protein, which I've talked about quite a bit here. Again, here's our mycelial. It diffuses across our enterocyte. It's packaged with this ApoB48 lipoprotein, and only after it's packaged, it can enter this duct, go to the thoracic duct, and enter our bloodstream. Imagine if you don't have this Apo lipoprotein, what's going to happen is that you can't get through here, and it's going to build up in your enterocytes. So as a presentation, you'll either see this in a young kid as a failure to thrive. That's actually usually how it presents. You can get steatorrhea, which is just fatty stools. You can get fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. I wanna point out that these two symptoms I just mentioned are not unique to A beta lipoproteinemia. Anything that causes fat malabsorption, even Whipple disease, which we just talked about, could easily cause these two. So. I don't want you to think that this is exclusive to this condition. On histology, you're going to see lipid bubbles inside enterocytes, which again should make sense because there's so many lipids inside here because of the backflow. And what that'll look like is you'll see all these lipid bubbles inside the enterocytes. So those five conditions we just talked about are quite similar to each other. Just remember some of the differences, like celiac has the iron deficiency anemia, young, young female with an autoimmune condition, uh, associated with gluten, villus atrophy, the crypt hyperplasia, the lymphocytosis. On Just remember all that. Lactose intolerant, remember the dairy or recent GI illness. Remember the histology is normal. Remember normal weight hydrogen breath test, decreased stool pH, all that stuff. Tropical sprue, they're only going to test as far as they had to have traveled to the tropics at some point and had an infectious diarrhea. Remember Whipple's disease, they have the can of whip pass. So remember cardiac, 
arthralgias, neurosymptoms, diarrhea, and remember the PAS positive macrophages. And then the A beta lipoproteinemia, all you have to remember is this lipid bubbles inside the enterocytes that we just talked about. And just remember this mechanism in some capacity. So let's talk about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth now. This, as the name suggests, is that you have an overgrowth of bacteria in your small intestine, and it can impair the absorption of several nutrients, including fats and B12. So how does it contribute to fat malabsorption? It's kind of interesting. I don't think this will be tested, but I found it kind of interesting, so I wanted to show you. Remember that bile is not absorbed in the enterocytes. It's actually absorbed in the terminal ileum. What's kind of interesting about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is that they can, these bacteria can actually deconjugate bile. And when this deconjugated bile enters the, the enterocytes, it's not properly reabsorbed. It actually gets degraded. And so you end up losing this the bile in this weird mechanism. And if you don't have bile, then you can have fat malabsorption and that can all get digest. You'll have steatorrhea. B12 malabsorption is related to the fact that B12 and intrinsic factor also have to go to the terminal ileum for absorption. And in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, the bacteria like to eat the B12 so you don't get any reabsorption. This can be caused by a few different things. First off, it should make sense that anybody who's immunocompromised, especially those with IgA deficiency, which is the antibody that thrives in the GI tract, they can have bacterial overgrowth. You can also see this in reduced gastric acid. So if you're taking a PPI, that's one of the symptoms. And I talk about this in our stomach lecture. When I talk about PPIs, you can get a few different infections, one of them being small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Another thing that could cause this is decreased peristalsis. So if you're not moving things along, it gives the bacteria who are alive there more time to colonize. So you can see this in things like long-standing diabetes, scleroderma, or in those who use opiates. You can also see this in pancreas or gallbladder dysfunction, where again, you're not, you're not having this steady secretion of lipases or bile has antimicrobial properties. And so each of those can help to reduce the risk of bacterial overgrowth. But if there's dysfunction, you might have it. This presents like many of our diseases we've just talked about. You get bloating, diarrhea, and flatulence. You can have some component of a malabsorption deficiency. This is very hard to diagnose. It's usually clinical diagnosis where you give somebody antibiotics and you see if it works. But on a test, they, if they're going to test you on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, they'll usually give you one of the risk factors we talked about like somebody long-term PPI use. They, and they'll also give you, I've seen this a few times where they give you the fact that there's greater than a thousand CFUs in the bacteria. I mean, in, in the jejunum. And you treat this with antibiotics because it is a bacterial overgrowth. Small bowel obstruction is finally something totally different. This is a blockage in your bowel. This will lead to proximal bowel distension. And so let's see what that looks like. Let's say you have a food bolus that's coming through your bowel. Let's say there's some obstruction here for whatever reason. What's going to happen is that food will back up proximal to that obstruction, and then it'll actually distend the bowel. The danger of that is that it could obviously perforate. So the number one cause of this are adhesions from a prior surgery. This can also happen in the setting of hernias. The third most common cause is cancer. And a rarer cause, but something that they do test sometimes, is intussusception. Let's go over each of these causes in the order of likelihood. So the most common cause in somebody who's, especially in somebody who's had surgery, are adhesions. So if you imagine you've had surgery in the past and you have all this inflammation before, that can develop into this scar tissue. And that scar tissue can actually attach to your bowel and start to move it around. And so imagine if that moves and constricts a portion of your bowel, it's too skinny there and that can cause an obstruction. Hernias, imagine a portion of your bowel gets pushed through 
an area that it's not supposed to get pushed through. So what can happen here is that this area is now constricted right here where, where it pushed through, it can have an external force compressing it, pushing it down and you can get an obstruction in this way. Cancer is pretty easy to understand. If you have a mass that's obstructing most of your lumen, you can get a small bowel obstruction. One thing I wanna note is when we talk about colon cancer, we'll mention this, it's that obstruction is more common in left-sided tumors, whereas the right-sided tumors more often present with bleeding symptoms. And last thing I wanna mention is intussusception. Intussusception is where one portion of your bowel gets pushed into another portion. So that would look something like this portion getting pushed into this one, might look something like this. And obviously because the lumen is decreased, you can get a small bowel obstruction in this case too. So how does this present? It usually presents as nausea and vomiting. You'll get constipation. You'll get a lack of flatulence, which is an important indicator that something may be blocked. You'll also get bloating and abdominal distension. On imaging, you're gonna see multiple small bowel dilations on X-ray, and you might see something called air fluid levels on CT. So on the X-ray to the left, it's it should be pretty obvious that these bowels are very, very dilated. And on the CT imaging, there's a few different examples of air fluid levels. So you can see that right here. That's, that's suggestive of a small bowel obstruction. So to treat this, there's a few things you can do. The first thing you do, if nothing's perforated yet, you usually wait, you, you can drain what's in the stomach with, through nasogastric suction. You wanna keep them NPO, which just means nil per us means you don't wanna give them anything by mouth because you'll just make the obstruction worse and you wanna control their pain. And then if their symptoms worsen or just aren't getting better, or if the bowel perforates, which you'll know, you should know about pretty quickly because they'll become very, very sick very quickly, then you'll want to involve surgery. Next, we're gonna talk about some of the blood-related conditions, acute and chronic mesenteric ischemia. These are kind of like our heart attacks and our angina of the intestines. So acute mesenteric ischemia is like an acute heart attack, basically. So it's an intestinal heart attack. It's usually caused by embolic occlusion of the SMA, and it leads to small bowel ischemia and necrosis. So I showed this earlier. Basically what happens here is that you have some sort of clot that's gonna break off and travel down your aorta, and sometimes it'll reach your GI tract. So the first structure it'll reach is the celiac trunk, but because the celiac trunk is so uh, branches off the aorta at such an extreme angle, it usually avoids getting a clot lodged into it. The problem with the SMA is it's pretty straightforward. It's not that extreme of an angle, so you can get a clot, and this would potentially cause acute mesenteric ischemia. You're going to see this in the same people you'll see regular heart attacks with. Right, And so these are called vasculopaths. So it's gonna be people with a ton of risk factors. They might be smoker, obese, type two diabetes. I wrote obesity twice for some reason. But anybody who has a ton of risk factors for a stroke or for peripheral artery disease or heart attack, those are the same people who I want you to consider may have acute or chronic mesenteric ischemia. This will present with severe abdominal pain. And you're gonna see something called current jelly stools which I talk about later, just, just so you know for now, current jelly stools I talk about in the intussusception section later on. Basically, it looks like uh, blood mixed with mucus. And the reason why that's happening is that you have cells that are actively dying off and your, your enterocytes that are connected to your lumen release all that mucus that they've had stored inside of them in addition to blood. And so that's why you get these things that are described as current jelly stools. You'll have this classic pain out of proportion where somebody is in writhing pain and then you do a physical exam and everything's normal. I don't want you to be reassured by that normal physical exam because it could easily mean they have this condition. You'll see decreased bowel sounds. And what you have to do, you have to treat it with emergent surgery. 
I want you to, emergent is important to realize this condition is extremely deadly. Like just like we treat heart attacks very early, you have to treat this intestinal heart attack very early. The earlier, the better. So chronic mesenteric ischemia is more like intestinal angina where you have symptoms when you're doing some activity, but then the symptoms go away at rest. So it's reversible, nothing's dying yet, nothing's necrotic. You get a little bit of ischemia that can cause pain, but then that ischemia starts to go away. It's usually postprandial, and this should make sense because when you eat food, that's when your intestines require more blood flow, that's when they're technically working the hardest is after you've eaten. So this is our acute mesenteric ischemia, which showed a heart attack. If we compare this one, which is a complete blockage causing necrosis, we'll compare it to chronic mesenteric ischemia, which isn't necessarily a complete blockage. Imagine you have like a plaque, a cholesterol plaque in the way, and during normal times, there's enough blood supply to get through and supply the distal tissues without a problem. But if we eat, the problem is that we require more blood flow to these regions. So we're really trying to push a lot of blood through this small area and what's going to happen is that the distal regions of this are not getting perfused enough, so they kind of get a little ischemic, and that can cause some pain. The classic patient is the exact same patient you'll see in acute mesenteric ischemia. That's your vasculopath, who has all the same symptoms. The presentation of this one is that you're going to see somebody who has abdominal pain after meals, like we discussed. You also might see somebody who has significant weight loss. And if you probe as to why they've been losing weight, they'll tell you that they just haven't been eating as much because it's too painful. You treat this with angioplasty, which is where you can put a stent in and kind of open up that area that had that plaque to avoid these symptoms. I just wanna point out here, I highlighted these specifically Whenever you see somebody with like abdominal pain and significant weight loss, it's very easy to think cancer. And I think on a test, most of the time, you'd probably be right. I just want you to remember that if the pain is postprandial and they give you a lot of these other risk factors, like they tell you that this person has hypertension, diabetes, they've had, they've had a stroke, they've had a heart attack. I want you to consider that it might actually be this chronic mesenteric ischemia. So keep that on your differential. The last thing we'll talk about for adult conditions is the carcinoid tumor and carcinoid syndrome. So the carcinoid tumor is a type of tumor that secretes serotonin. It's usually located in the small intestine. It could also be located in the stomach, the rectum, or the appendix. And how this presents, the tough thing about carcinoid tumors is that they're gonna be asymptomatic if they're just within their GI tract, but if they've spread somewhere else, they can give something called carcinoid syndrome. So let's talk about what carcinoid syndrome looks like. Carcinoid syndrome is a syndrome that occurs because of widespread release of serotonin into your blood. And a question you're probably asking yourself is, why don't all carcinoid tumors cause carcinoid syndrome? Well, the good news is that we have a few of our organs that can metabolize serotonin and prevent serotonin from being active in our bloodstream, namely in our liver and lungs. So if this is our bloodstream, every GI tract organ will drain into our portal system. So if we have, uh, here's our carcinoid tumor, it's gonna secrete serotonin. That's gonna go into our portal circulation the vast majority of the time. And when it encounters the liver, the liver is able to metabolize it into an inactive compound called 5-HIAA. And this can be excreted in the kidneys and you'll never have carcinoid syndrome. The thing is, what if you had a metastatic lesion on your liver or distal to your liver? What's gonna happen here is that this can secrete serotonin and the liver can no longer metabolize it because it's distal to the liver. So this can travel through your hepatic vein into your IVC and go into your right heart. And from the right heart, you'll go into your lungs. From the lungs, you'll go to your left heart. 
Remember, the liver and the lungs contain enzymes. So once it reaches the lungs, it'll also be metabolized, which can be excreted, which will spare your left heart from symptoms. So when we talk about the presentation, there's a common mnemonic called BFDR. Our B is for bronchospasm. Our F is for flushing. Our D is for secretory diarrhea. And our R is for right-sided heart defects. And again, if we talk about here, notice that our lungs are, are preventing serotonin from reaching our left heart and causing damage to the left heart. So you'll only see right-sided defects. You'll also, something they sometimes test is the fact that carcinoid syndrome can cause niacin deficiency, which is vitamin B3. Niacin deficiency, a good mnemonic for niacin deficiency is our three Ds. You have dermatitis, dementia, and death. And why does niacin deficiency happen? What's going on here is that tryptophan can be broken down into a few things, one of which is serotonin. Serotonin's actual name is 5-hydroxytryptophan. So you can see that tryptophan has, is, um, serotonin is a byproduct of tryptophan. Tryptophan can also be used in the formation of niacin. The problem with carcinoid syndrome is that we're producing so much serotonin that there's not enough tryptophan left to produce niacin. So you can get this niacin deficiency, which again can, pre can present with that dermatitis, dementia, and death. How do you diagnose carcinoid tumor? You can, any neuroendocrine tumor would have elevated chromogran and A levels. That's one way. But the way that they usually test on a, on a test is they like to do elevated 5-HIAA levels in the urine. Recall from here that all of the metabolites from the liver and the lung metabolism will end up going into the kidneys as 5-HIAA. So to detect this, especially on a test, you should always be picking this as your diagnostic criteria for carcinoid syndrome. If you did biopsy it somehow, you'd find out that the tumor cells are chromogranin and synaptophysin positive. I think that's pretty low yield. As long as you remember the 5-HIAA, you should be set on a test. Let's go over the embryologic and childhood conditions. Of the 10 lectures, this is the one I'm gonna spend most time on because there's quite a few embryologic and childhood conditions that affect the small intestine. Let's start with Meckel's diverticulum. This is the most common GI tract abnormality, it happens in about 2% of the population. And how it works is that you have something called persistence of the vitiline duct. The vitiline duct, which I'll show you a picture of in a second, connects our embryologic midgut to the yolk sac. So what does that look like? If this is our embryologic GI tract, it can be broken down into our foregut, our midgut, and our hindgut. And notice this region here, this is our vitiline duct. And its only purpose really is to obtain nutrients from our yolk sac. And our yolk sac is something that we can get nutrients for when we're very, very, very young in utero. It helps us until our placenta develops fully and can provide all of the nutrients that we require. So once the placenta is big enough and it's, it's starting to carry the load, we don't really need our yolk sac or our vitiline duct anymore. And they, can act, they actually involute. So these will naturally go away and that's totally normal. So if we look at normal involution, what that would look like is everything's gone, no problems. And Meckel's diverticulum, we're gonna have some persistence of the vitiline duct. So instead of involuting all the way, we might have some persistence right here. Some other things that they rarely test on, you can get something called a vitiline fistula, which is where barely anything involutes and it actually connects with your anterior abdominal wall. And because it's directly connected to your GI tract, you can actually have uh, meconium or poop coming out of your like belly button through this. So if you ever see that, consider a vitiline fistula. And the last thing they sometimes test are on vitiline cysts, 
This is where instead of involuting, you can get a cyst form. It could be anywhere along the vitellin duct. So sometimes it'll be pressing against the abdomen and you can palpate a vitellin cyst if you palpate around the belly button. Something to keep in mind is that the vitellin duct contains stem cells that can differentiate into other, can other cell types like gastric mucosa, pancreatic tissue. And we'll get back into why that's important when I talk about how Meckel's diverticulum usually presents. And at the type of diverticulum that you have to know is that this is a true diverticulum involving all four layers of our GI tract. So in our GI tract, we have a lumen, a mucosa, a submucosa, our muscular layer, and then the serosa or adventitia. And when we look at diverticula, you can have a true diverticulum, which involves all four layers, or a false diverticulum, where the muscular layer is not involved. So a true diverticulum would look like this, where all four layers are involved in the outpouching, whereas a false diverticulum would look like this, where you can see the muscular layer here has been cut and broken through. So the diverticulum actually only contains three of your four GI tract layers. And you can see some of the conditions that involve a false diverticulum. And in this case, this is our first example of a true diverticulum where all four layers are involved. So how does this present? Most of the time you don't know about it, it's asymptomatic. But you could also have painless GI bleeding. That's a very common complaint. Why do you have painless GI bleeding? Well, if we consider that there's some persistence of our vitellin duct, recall that this duct contains stem cells that can transform into other tissues, one of which being gastric mucosa. So if you have some part of your stomach cells produced in this area, you can produce a lot of hydrogen ions. And there's nothing to really neutralize these hydrogen ions because all of our bases were up in our duodenum. So these hydrogen ions can damage your GI tract and lead to painless GI bleeding. You can also get right lower quadrant abdominal pain for that same reason. It could be painful bleeding as well. And you also might experience the symptoms related to specific complications of Meckel's diverticulum. And some of those complications are obstruction, volvulus, and intussusception. I'm just going to talk about why intussusception might happen in somebody with Meckel's. Intussusception is where if, if our bowel is flowing from left to right on the screen, it's where this region actually telescopes into this region. And normally this, this wouldn't happen under normal conditions, but in Meckel's, you actually have a lead point where the small bowel can get, I mean, the proximal section can get stuck on that distal section and end up pulling through. And the only reason that was possible is because if I go back, this right here will act as a lead point where let's say this distal section actually gets stuck and then this section can kind of come through causing this to happen. So how do you diagnose this? You diagnose this through something called the technetium 99M protectinate syntography. Yeah, you don't have to know that name. You don't have to know how to say it, but you definitely have to know that name. If you ever see a protectinate scan, they're probably talking about Meckel's. It's called a Meckel scan in real life, but they're not going to give you that on a test because they're not nice. And I just want you to know what this protectinate scan does so it's easier for you to remember. All Its whole job is to detect gastric mucosa. So I really like this picture here because it shows you exactly what Meckel scan does. You can see up in the top right, it's detecting gastric mucosa in your stomach, which is totally expected. You'll also see some gastric mucosa. I mean, you'll see some of the contrast get into your bladder, which again is totally normal. This right here that they've highlighted in red shows that there's gastric mucosa in your right lower quadrant, which should not be there. And that's because you have a persistence of your vitellin duct or Meckel's diverticulum that's ending up producing some gastric mucosa in that region. A mnemonic that you'll commonly see is the rule of twos. You'll see that 2% of the population is affected. It's two times likelier in males. You'll often see it diagnosed within the first two years of life. 
the diverticulum itself, that persistent vitelline duct is about two inches long and usually located around two feet from your ileocecal valve. And it can remind you, the rule of twos can remind you that there's two types of ectopic tissue, your gastric mucosa and your pancreas. The next embryologic condition I want to discuss is intussusception. This is caused by telescoping of the proximal bowel into a distal segment. And we just saw that in the Meckles thing, but it's where this section goes into this one and leads into this. Oftentimes, we don't know the cause of intussusception, but there are several conditions that act as lead points. The first being Meckles diverticulum that we discussed earlier. You can also have a mass that can cause intussusception. And if you ever see intussusception in an adult, you should assume there's some sort of mass there, whether it's cancer or polyp or what have you, it's unclear, but masses can cause that. Another lead point I want you to know about is called lymphoid hyperplasia. And this can be caused by either the rotavirus infection, vaccine, adenovirus, IgA vasculitis. On tests, they usually like to test this in the context of rotavirus whether it's the infection or the vaccine. So let's talk a little bit about the lead points. Uh, we talked about Meckles earlier, where if you have this vitiline duct persistence, that can act as a lead point and cause intussusception. Imagine if you have a mass here that basically gives you a point that can, uh, a lead point where the bowel can start to focus in and move toward it. And then lymphoid hyperplasia, uh, I'm going to remind you from our anatomy section that there are Peyer's patches, especially in the terminal ilium. And what can happen is that in the setting of an infection or a va recent vaccination, these can get very big and they can ultimately act as a lead point and also cause intussusception. So how does this present? You're going to have usually have an infant with severe colicky abdominal pain. You're gonna have current jelly red stools. This is a picture of current jelly. And I want you to realize that it kind of looks like blood and mucus. And that's, that's exactly what it's composed of. So if you can imagine that when you're in this process of intussusception, what's gonna happen is that the enterocytes that are on in this section are gonna get damaged and they're gonna slough off. And when they slough off, you're gonna have blood and mucus released and you'll have that current jelly stool. You see this current jelly stool in acute mesenteric ischemia as well. And that's because you have a significant region of bowel necrosis. So you have a lot of enterocytes sloughing off in that condition as well, resulting in this blood and mucus filled current jelly stool. Oftentimes on tests, they'll mention that a child will draw their legs into their chest. They'll kind of curl up into a ball to alleviate the pain. And you can remember this by the mnemonic that people will curl in with intussusception. You can diagnose it in a few ways. The first being uh, you'll notice a sausage-shaped mass. You can palpate on physical examination. On ultrasound, you'll see a target sign, and you can see it on the right, especially, you can see that, that view showing that one bowel is stuck inside of the other. And the last way to diagnose it is through an enema. And the good thing about an enema is that it's diagnostic and therapeutic. So oftentimes we treat people with presumed intussusception with an enema, and you can use a wide variety of things. And why that works is because an enema will cause back pressure, and that can undo this intussusception that's been going on. Unfortunately, enemas don't always work. So if the patient still has persistent recurrence of this intussusception, they may need surgery to fix it. Now we'll move on to gastro gastroschisis and umphalocele. So gastros, I cannot say that word, gastroschisis. That is a para-umbilical bowel herniation. And what para-umbilical means is just it's around the belly button. It's not 100% symmetric down the midline. It's kind of a little off-center. 
This is not covered by peritoneum, so you'll just see open bowel that's popping out. This has no association with a genetic syndrome either. So let me show you what that looks like first. This is our embryologic uh, gut. We have our foregut, midgut, and hindgut. Here's our anterior abdominal wall. What happens in gastroschisis, I can't with that word, um, is that you have a, def a defect in your anterior abdominal wall and it prevents it from closing 100%. So instead of it being closed like this, you might have a little opening here and some of that bowel as it grows can escape through that region. And again, this is para umbilical. You can notice how it's not directly at, along midline. And just remember with gastro gastroschisis that it's not covered by peritoneum and it's not associated with genetic syndromes. You can see a picture of that right here. And a good mnemonic that I saw, I believe in first aid, I wanna give credit to where it is. I'll check, I think it's first aid, is that they remember gas, gastroschisis and umphalocele for the first letter. So G is an asymmetric letter, and that can remind you that it's para umbilical or asymmetric herniation. And you can notice that G cannot encase anything, and that should remind you that the bowel that comes out in gastro gastroschisis is not covered by peritoneum. Let's move on to a word that I can pronounce a little bit better, umphalocele. So in umphalocele, this is a midline bowel herniation. This is surrounded by peritoneum and it is associated with a few genetic syndromes. So how this works is that in general, our body, as our abdomen grows and our liver grows, what's gonna happen is our liver pushes our midgut and causes what's called a physiologic herniation. And normally this happens and we have a little bowel rotation. And then as our abdominal cavity gets bigger, our bowel will come back into our abdominal cavity. So you don't have a herniation anymore. In omphalocele, you have a problem of actually coming back into the abdominal cavity. So you have a midline bowel herniation that stays in place even after birth. And this is surrounded by peritoneum and it's associated with genetic syndromes. And this is a picture of what that might look like. And the mnemonic that first aid gives is you have to think about the O in omphalocele. And just remember that the letter O is symmetric. So you'll have a symmetric herniation right down the midline. And remember that the letter O, you can put something and encase it in the letter O. And that should remind you that umphalocele is surrounded by peritoneum. And here's a chart if you're just studying quickly and you wanna know, you have a para umbilical herniation and gastro gastroschisis and a midline and umphalocele. You get no peritoneum in the condition that starts with the G and you do have peritoneum in umphalocele. And just note that G is associated, is not associated with genetic syndromes whereas omphalocele is. Okay, duodenal atresia. Duodenal atresia is a failure to recanalize the duodenum. This is associated with Down syndrome. You can remember the D in duodenal atresia for the D in Down syndrome. So what happens here is that early on, our epithelium is proliferating all over the place. It's not like you keep an open lumen throughout your entire GI development it actually grows into that region temporarily and your body is able to eventually take out the cells that it doesn't need and create a healthy lumen. In duodenal atresia, however, you have this epithelial proliferation into the lumen and your body forgets to remove it. And what happens over time is that that epithelialization will, will create its own dead ends basically. And so you have this connection and it, nothing recanalized. And so that's how you get duodenal atresia. And so this will present very quickly in life because you, you don't have a GI tract that functions well. In the first 48 hours of life, you're gonna have either bilious or non-bilious vomiting. So let's talk about what that means. Bilious vomiting is yellow-green vomit, and you'll see that in the presence of bile. And you only see this in conditions where 
your basically your oral cavity and all the way through the second portion of your duodenum are clear where you have a connection between those so if you imagine and that the only reason that would be the case is because all of our bile is coming from our gall, gallbladder into the second portion of our duodenum so let's say for example that you had this duodenal atresia located distal to this region you would see bilious vomiting because this bile can come back proximally and you can throw it up. But if in duodenal atresia, if it happens proximal to where the common bile duct empties into your duodenum, you would have non-bilious vomiting. So you can, you can present with either in this case. You'll see abdominal distension oftentimes. But what they really love to test you on and what you have to know is that on x-ray, you're going to see what's known as the double bubble sign. And this is a dilated stomach and proximal duodenum. So here's an x-ray of somebody with duodenal atresia. You can see here that one of the bubbles is the stomach and the second bubble is located here. That's our proximal duodenum. And I'll show you what that looks like. Let's imagine you have duodenal atresia right here. Our first bubble is our stomach. Our second bubble will be this duodenum. And the reason there are two bubbles is because remember, we still have this pyloric sphincter right here that can close and create two distinct gas filled cavities. You have to treat this surgically in order to fix it. And let's talk about the other types of atresia, jejunal and ileal atresia. These actually arise from a totally different mechanism than duodenal atresia. They arise from disrupted vascular supply. That, that can lead to necrosis, and then you'll get bowel resorption. So this can happen to anybody, really. If in utero, there's a lot of stuff going on, and so sometimes you might have a vascular event. Let's say you have a vascular event that affects this portion of your bowel. What's going to happen is that this portion of your bowel will die, and these two ends will resorb and form two different ends. So now you have atresia. Again, this will present very early on. This will always present with bilious vomiting though, because as we just saw, the bile can easily reach the duodenum and exit to the oral cavity in the event of vomiting because all the bleeding uh, in jejunal and ileal atresia happened much more distal to this section. Again, you'll see abdominal distension. A good way to differentiate this from duodenal atresia is that you'll see a triple bubble sign. And remember that the both jejunal and ileal atresia, because they're happening spontaneously after vascular events, they're not associated with things like Down syndrome. So here's a triple bubble sign. You can see the stomach, here's the duodenum, and then there's the jejunum. So you get three different bubbles appearing. And again, this has to be treated surgically. We're almost done. Let's talk about malrotation and midgut volvulus. So malrotation, as the name suggests, is abnormal rotation in utero, utero specifically of the midgut. And you'll end up with improper bowel positioning. So what happens here if we have our embryologic midgut? Normally, our liver is going to push and cause this physiologic herniation. While it's herniated, you're going to have uh, 90 degrees of rotation, then your bowel is going to get pushed back into the normal abdominal cavity, and you'll have another 180 degrees of rotation. They do want you to know that there's a total of 270 degrees counterclockwise rotation during our development. And any defect in this process can lead to malrotation. Here's probably a better picture showing the malrotation. You have, you can notice here, we have our 90 degrees. This shows the rotation happening prior to herniation. I've seen it both ways where you can herniate first and then you have your 90 degrees. And then what happens is that the bowel will return and then you'll have another 180 degrees post herniation. And notice that's, that's how we form our cecum right here in the right lower quadrant. And then we have our intestines and we have our, you know, ascending, transverse, descending colon. You could already see it forming after this herniation. And there's the 90 and then there's the 180 that we talked about. So a complication of malrotation that you have to consider is duodenal obstruction and volvulus. 
The reason this happens is that we have something called LAD bands. So LAD bands normally attach our cecum to the right lower quadrant, but if they're in the right upper quadrant, they can start messing with different regions of your small intestine, especially your duodenum. So what, let's see how that works in action. So LAD bands normally attach your cecum to your right lower quadrant. So here's our correctly rotated bowel, and we'll have a LAD band there, and you're not going to have any problems. The thing is, in malrotation, your cecum's in the right upper quadrant, or it can be midline like it is here. And if you have a LAD band in this region, what's going to happen is that it, that LAD band can start messing with the duodenum that's located up there. I'm going to show you that the duodenum's just right there, and that can cause either duodenal obstruction or a midgut volvulus. And a midgut volvulus would be where the duodenum starts twisting on itself. So let's talk about what's going on with a midgut volvulus. There's there's different types of volvulus, but midgut is the one you're often going to see in young, young, young people. It's due to a congenital malrotation, and it's because of the these LAD bands allow basically our intestinal, our intestines are kind of this free flowing organ and they can't twist around each other that well because they don't have anything to grasp onto to start twisting around itself. But the problem is these LAD bands, if a LAD band attaches to your duodenum, now that you've created something that the duodenum can use to start twisting around its own mesentery and cause a volvulus. This will present with bilious vomiting during the first weeks of life. You'll see transient abdominal pain as it twists and untwists. You can diagnose this with an upper GI barium series. You can also see air fluid levels on an x-ray. And you have to correct this surgically. When I think about how they test this, they usually test it in the setting of You'll know somebody has a midgut volvulus, and then they ask you why this happened, and you'll have to know that there was some sort of malrotation that caused the volvulus, or they'll tell you that somebody has malrotation, and they'll tell you they'll ask you what they're at risk for, and the answer would be midgut volvulus. The last two are pretty low yield, but I wanted to include it for completion's sake. Necrotizing enterocolitis. This is as the name somewhat suggests with the necrotizing, this is necrosis of your intestinal mucosa in newborns. You'll always see premature delivery. I've never heard of a question of somebody or even a real case in life where somebody who's at term will develop this. Always related to premature delivery and formula feedings are, are really important risk factors. What can happen with necrotizing enterocolitis? is you can have perforation because your bowel's dying. And a really important test that they like to show is they'll give you an X-ray that shows this thing called pneumatosis intestinalis, which is air within the bowel wall. And here you can see this X-ray looks nothing like anything we've seen before. And that's because you have air filling up the bowel wall in a ton of these different regions. And this is called pneumatosis intestinalis. So if you get a question, what will happen is they'll give you a question of a baby who's born at like 30 weeks or 28 weeks, let's say, and they're getting formula fed and they have all this pain and they do an x-ray and it shows this. They want you to realize that that's necrotizing enterocolitis. The last disease I'm going to go over is hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. I mentioned this briefly when we talked about fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, but vitamin K is normally synthesized by our intestinal bacteria. And the problem with little kids, newborns, is that they haven't developed their bacterial flora yet, so they could actually have a vitamin K deficiency. This is why that we, in the United States at least, every newborn gets a vitamin K injection to prevent them from this specific condition. So vitamin K is a cofactor for multiple clotting factors. And if you have any vitamin K deficiency, it can lead to bleeding. I showed you this earlier in the vitamin K, the fat soluble vitamin deficiency section. But here, I just wanna mention that vitamin K is normally synthesized. 
and it's a cofactor for several of these clotting factors. And I've highlighted them here. And all these clotting factors, their main job is to ultimately give you a fibrin clot. And if you have a deficiency in any of these factors, it can lead to bleeding. So this will present as somebody with significant bleeding. Often they'll give, they'll present with intracranial bleeding in a patient who hasn't received any prenatal care or postnatal care mostly. You'll see on labs an elevated PT and PTT, and you'll see a normal bleeding time. I talk about this in the DIC lecture and then liver diseases as well, but it's important to know the difference between prothrombin time and partial thromboplastin time. So PT or prothrombin time, a good mnemonic to remember what pathway will elevate your PT. Remember that you play tennis outside, and so you'll get damage to the extrinsic pathway, will elevate your PT, essentially because vitamin K is a cofactor for factor seven. If you have a deficiency of factor seven, that's going to affect your extrinsic pathway, and that can prolong your PT. So that's why that's elevated. PTT is elevated in this case. And I want you to remember that PTT, the mnemonic is that you play table tennis indoors. That should remind you that PTT is a measure of your in intrinsic pathway. And again, you can notice that factor nine, factor 10 are affected and they're part of your intrinsic pathway. And any defect in your intrinsic pathway will elevate your PTT. And the last thing we'll talk about is your bleeding time. Uh, your bleeding time has nothing to do with this coagulation cascade that we're seeing. Your bleeding time has everything to do with your platelets. So because your platelets are fine, there's no damage. Your vitamin K is not required for platelet formation and activation. There's no damage, so you'll have normal bleeding time. You have to treat this with vitamin K, which makes sense, and you can give transfusions as needed. And like I said earlier, is that the main treatment we have is more preventative. If you give vitamin K injections to newborns, you avoid this disease altogether. And we finally arrived at the end of our unit. So thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time for our sixth lecture, which will be on the colon. Thank you.